These words in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We as humans, and particularly as Christians, with a view always toward the wholeness offered to us by Christ, live in the gap. That space between our reality and what we believe God desires for us. This can be the distance between our broken bodies and souls and true healing. It can be the pause between the ache in our hearts and the tears which long to flow. It can be the interval between our yearning and fulfillment. And it can be the break between the desires of our heart and the fractured relationships we often find ourselves in. We can perceive this gap as holy space filled with God's blessings as the Beatitudes invite us into. Or we can attempt to fill this gap with falseness, which can manifest in excess possessions, or pride in our own accomplishments, or pushing for positions of prestige, or having unhealthy relationships, or a hardened heart toward those who desire our compassion or empathy. In our gospel today, Jesus alerts the world to the gap, that chasm between the reality of the world and God's dream for the world, which humankind may never have become aware of were it not for Jesus' prophetic word and actions, and his unique ability to fill that gap with the pronouncement of God's blessing upon all people. In Jesus' words, the blessed are not the rich and powerful, but rather they are the ones clamoring around him, eavesdropping on the conversation with those perceived as within Jesus' inner circle. They were the ones who were bringing the sick and the infirm to be healed. The blessed are those who wallow in the hardness of their lives. For God is ever-present, holding and loving and encouraging and supporting and guiding them into the fullness God desires for them. God's blessing is never a reward for our worldly success. God's blessing comes first. And out of that blessing, spiritual growth and true faith in God emerges. And then regardless of our life situation, we know the fullness and the depth of a God who loves us beyond measure, who finds us worthy of blessing, not because of what we've done or who we are, but by the very nature of God. Now this statement is rather shocking to most of us and was staggering to the people of Jesus' time. The author of Matthew's Gospel sets the stage for this thunderclap moment of outrageous truth from the beginning of the gospel so that the world can wake up to Jesus' call to turn the world upside down again, to bring it back into faithfulness, into God's truth. In the very first verse of this gospel, Jesus is called the Messiah, and the author spends some time from there on forward summing up the crowd's expectation of a powerful and a political Messiah. The author encourages his audience to fall prey into the falseness of this perceived communal truth of God's anointed one by connecting Jesus to the genealogy that had produced the great King David. And through those exotic visitors from the East who pay homage to the newborn King of the Jews and to John the Baptist who speaks of the Messiah who when he will arrive, he will rise with power and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, and he's going to bring justice down on the wicked and set things straight. But the new way of being that Jesus proclaims in the Beatitudes is the reversal of that usual way of the world. It's not to align with the powerful and mighty. It is not to replace one system of oppression, the Roman Empire, with another, but it is to value humility and righteousness and mercy. 
So Jesus came to show us the gap and to close the gap. If only we are willing to trust, to believe, to count on a God who does not show up in the glitter and the acclamations, but who shows up in the people who gather around him, who struggle, who doubt, who make bad choices, who hold their children with empty bellies through the night, who come empty-handed and empty-hearted to a God who desires to fill them with God's love. For the past four weeks, our gospel stories have been centered in the tension of the Jerusalem temple during Holy Week when Jesus was tested and ridiculed, and when finally the religious officials catch on to the truth that Jesus shared on this mountaintop at the very beginning of his ministry, when he sat down with the authority of God in the stance of a rabbi, and he brought people's hearts to, into his own, and he taught about the kingdom of heaven here and now, which looked nothing like the world constructed in the temple or in the empire. The Sermon on the Mount was the beginning of the storm cloud, which gathered momentum as the thunder and lightning in the temple scene, culminating in Jesus' crucifixion and covered the land in darkness on Holy Saturday. And then the radiant sun breaks through and shines with Jesus' resurrection. But the storm began right here in our gospel story today. Jesus' radical thinking and proclamation, which turned the world upside down, is that God's blessing is first, not a reward, but given to us by God's very nature of, a, of the abundant, generous, and life-giving love. Now, one could imagine that we all should actually know this, that we would instinctively know this truth, that blessing comes first. For the creation story in Genesis tells us that as God began to create, God blessed the world with these words, and it was very good. And we know in our baptism, through the movement of the Holy Spirit, God poured blessing upon blessing into our hearts, giving us all that we would ever need to fill the gap. And we begin each Sunday with the words, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the reply, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. We begin our worship by proclaiming God's blessing and our blessing God by opening the space for God to fill the gap within us. And if only for a moment, because those of us who believe or who have experienced even a glimpse of the holy, you know that moment of blessing? That moment contains all moments, and it lasts a lifetime. Blessing comes first. <clears throat> then we devote our lifetimes to living out of that blessing, and that makes all the difference in the world. We don't need to cajole God into blessing us. We don't need to concern how are we going to get God's blessing or how are we going to keep it. Instead, all we need to do is open the eyes of our heart to see God's blessing around us. That means that wherever we are, whatever hardship, whatever disgrace or shame, whatever unfair treatment we are enduring, God's blessing is with us. And every time we acknowledge the blessing of God, every time we live in response to the presence of the divine within and among us, that gap closes. God's blessing <coughs> may come to us in another person's soft touch, or a kind word, or a smile, or gentle wisdom shared over a cup of tea, through someone's healing hands placed upon our shoulders, or someone's outstretched hands to ours, or through sudden insight, inspiration, or creativity. <coughs> and God's blessing always, always happens in the sacrament of the Eucharist. 
There is an intentional gap that happens when I break the bread during the Eucharistic prayer. I have taken something whole, representing the body of Christ, the wholeness of the love of God, the completeness of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and I break it. You may notice that I pause. I break it and I pause, just like that. And I allow <coughs> the enormity of what I have just symbolically done. I have broken the body of Christ, representing the worst of all of humanity in Jesus' crucifixion. And so I pause for this action to settle into your hearts and souls. I have purposefully opened the gap. I have created this space for absence, for longing, and for some of us, despair. Then if you watch closely, I draw the two halves together again, overlapping a bit, and I invite you into a moment of prayer. For there is spaciousness there. It is a time to wonder. It is a time to anticipate receiving this holy gift within our very being. And as I bring these two pieces of broken bread together, I imagine even for a fleeting second, maybe I can put them back together again. Maybe I can fill the gap myself, as so often we wish to do with our own lives, to swiftly eliminate the sense of emptiness, to purge the sense of loss, to disperse the despair, and I realize that moment in the service is like Holy Saturday, that space in which we often find our lives between when something has ended and the new has yet to emerge. That dark womb-like space where the seeds of the new creation are germinating deep in the soil of God's love. This is the time between what has been made holy by the Spirit and the bread is given to you, and it is holy space, and it is holy time, like all the gaps that we find ourselves in. It is holy space and time, because God's blessing is in this. And then, of course, we break these two halves into yet smaller pieces, so you each can receive one, so you each hold a piece of the love which fills that gap, so the broken body of Jesus can come, can become for the world this unified body of Christ. So you take this piece of bread, which is bread and it's so much more, within your body and you are blessed, just as you are. As Jesus on that mountaintop looked into the eyes and the hearts of those who came empty-handed and empty-hearted, knowing his love and God's blessing was all they would ever need. And you take this within you. God's blessing flows, touching all those broken places, all those places of sorrow and grief, fills all the gaps, healing all the hurt within you and within our world. As we come forward to present our bodies, the fullness of who we are, as Christ presents himself fully to you, we remember that the body of Christ is here for you in your particularity and your individuality. And for you, that is all of our community. We know the intimacy of the gift of God's presence. We're blessed. Now, it's really wise to notice the gaps in your life. And that can be a very personal journey we may discern the space between how we're living our lives and what God has asked us to do. Or we may perceive the space between our desire to follow God and our lack of clarity that we even have any idea what that's about. Or our attentiveness to this gap can be communal between what our parish is doing right now and what God's reach for us might be leading us into. Or <coughs> the gap, listen to the news, is always between the earth's reality and God's dream for 
for all of creation. It is God's blessing that finds us wherever we are and challenges us and supports us and guides us and fills our gaps. But we need to notice first. We need to notice the gap. That's the first step. And then we need to look around for God's blessing. And that's not only the second step, but it's the last step. Because that is the origin of our faithful lives. On this day of the celebration of all saints, we also can understand that the ones experiencing the fullness of life, which is eternal life, they are guiding us along too. They are loving us into fullness. They are showering us with blessedness, which consumes their very souls, and they can be beacons of hope for us, our shining examples. They are the ones who have traversed the gap between this life and the next with great love and deep faith. We can look to those who have gone before us, and we can look to the God who holds us all in love and blessedness. I get it. It is really counterintuitive to believe that God is always trustworthy and that God, even in our hardest moments, is blessing us. That God is already with us, among us, surprising us with gracious and undeserved love. But I believe it with all my heart. For God is turning the world upside down again through our actions and hearts into something beautiful again. We are called to live our lives in response to that grace. Amen. <laughs>